evening, depending on when you're watching this, everyone. Welcome to Chef AJ Live, the first live of the day. And I have been wanting to interview this next guest ever since I met him. He is just one of the most wonderful doctors in the plant-based world. And I remember all the times I was in Vegetarian Summerfest. For some reason, my room was always next to him in the dorm. And all I ever heard from his room was laughter. He has the most delightful laugh, the, the wonder, most wonderful smile. And if you don't know him, you are going to get to know him. His name is Dr. Milton Mills. And he's going to be talking about the human diet and design. Thank you so much for finally getting together with me. I'm so excited um, to talk to you. Yeah, my pleasure, AJ. Absolutely. Yeah. So before you tell us uh, all the great things you know about plant-based nutrition, how did you get started in this field? Because you, you're wearing scrubs, so obviously yeah. you're a real doctor. Right. Well, actually, it's 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 an I, it's an interesting story, and it actually goes back to my teenage years. And it's it's a little it's not the traditional story. So let me give you try to give you a Reader's Digest version. Um, when I was 13 years old, um, my Mother called uh, my brothers and I in and told us that she and my dad were going to get a divorce. And um, that came as a shock because my parents weren't uh, at each other's throats. They weren't arguing all the time. So we had no idea that there was any kind of a problem. And um, it, it, of course, felt like my entire world sort of exploded. And my response to that was to ask the question, uh, of myself was, you know, life going to be sort of an endless series of painful, unavoidable uh, uh, experiences that hit you out of the blue? Or was there some way to navigate life um, and minimize these bad experiences and try to maximize the good ones? So from that, I felt that the first thing I had to do was, was figure out if God was real. Because if God was not real, I didn't want to spend my life in a useless round of religious observances and uh, ceremonies that ultimately were worthless. But the opposite was equally true, that if in fact God does exist, it would be absurd to try and live one's life without interacting with him, knowing who he is, and, and so forth. So from that, I uh, initially, I started talking to um, various religious leaders and asking them, you know, trying to get some understanding of the Bible, but uh, people would tell me things that um, just didn't make sense to me. And when I would ask them, press them uh, with questions, they would say, well, you just have to accept it. Um, you, you can't ask that question and you just have to uh, believe what I'm telling you, which again, made no sense to me because I thought, well, why would God give me an intellect and then tell me not to use it? So I finally decided that I was not going to talk to religious authorities, that if God in fact did exist and the Bible was his uh, 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 gift to us and his written word, that I could read the Bible, talk to him and he should be able to tell me what it means. And so that's what I started doing. And um, I, I will say that it, it, it was a kind of a shocking and a little bit unsettling experience because I started talking to God and he started talking back to me. So long story short, from what I read in the Bible and looking at the church's uh, doctrines as they existed, uh, it led me to become a Seventh-day Adventist because um, the Seventh-day Adventist church uh, was the denomination that most closely adhered to what the Bible recommended. Um, and one of the things that is, is um, uh, 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 well, I, what is the word, um, characteristic, for lack of a better word, about uh, um, the Adventist Church is that it recommends that all of the members adopt a plant-based diet. It doesn't require it, but it does recommend it. And it recommends that because right up front in the very first chapter of Genesis, God said, told Adam and Eve, I want you to be vegans. Um, and even later, when he had to put them out of the Garden of Eden, he expanded their diet, but he still only wanted them to eat a plant-based diet. So it's clear that's the diet that God designed us to eat, and that was his wishes. Now, um, you know, I came from a family where both my parents were from the South. My mom was a magnificent cook, and um, I ate a lot of meat growing up, and I didn't think I could live without it. I mean, the the one of the things the church does insist on is that 
you you have to stop eating what are considered unclean meats like pork, shellfish, and things like that. And so I thought I had already made, already made a big enough sacrifice, giving up my mom's pork chops. Um, but I could not imagine living without a hamburger or steak or, or whatever. But about a year and a half after I joined the church, I was struggling with some personal issues that I couldn't seem to get past. And I was talking to God about it one night. And he said to me very clearly, if you want a closer relationship with me, you need a clearer mind. And for that, you need a better diet. You have to stop eating meat. And um, I remember I felt kind of this momentary panic, like, how am I going to do this? I can't do this. Uh, and so I just said, look, I said, God, if you want me to stop eating it, you have to take away the desire to eat it. And, um, and he did. And I stopped. And I haven't eaten meat since. Um, uh, and that was over 40 years ago. Wow. Um, so you've actually been vegan as long as me. For no, no, no. That I was vegetarian. Oh. Now, um, I transitioned to vegan around 2000. And what brought that on was um, I finished residency in 1995. I was working at outpatient clinics and I kept having um, um, people of color, primarily African-Americans coming in telling me, oh doc, my, my spastic colon or my irritable bowel is acting up and it's really bothering me. And, um, and my being aware of the prevalence of lactose intolerance amongst uh, African-Americans, I would do a careful history and it was clear they were still eating dairy foods. So I would ask them, listen, I think this is the dairy. So what I want you to do, go uh, two weeks, no dairy whatsoever, come back and we'll see if the problem had resolved. And in without question about eight to nine out of 10 cases, the problem went away. So I explained to the person, you you don't have a spastic colon or an arable bowel. The problem is you're eating things that you shouldn't be eating, that your body can't tolerate. But the, the, the sort of, you know, kind of denouement came when this one Af elderly African-American, or I should say older African-American woman came back and um, sure enough, problem had stopped. And I said to her with this sense of satisfaction, well, you're lactose intolerant. That's why you're having these symptoms. And she looked at me and said, oh, I know that. And I was completely taken aback. And I said, then why are you still eating these things? And she said, because the government says I have to. Uh, the dietary guidelines says you have to have X number of servings uh, of dairy foods per day. And then that really made me viscerally angry because I knew that the US government and the uh, uh, healthy human services, everybody has known for over a hundred years about the prevalence rates of lactose intolerance amongst uh, ethnic groups. And furthermore, for reasons that are still not well understood, African-American women are genetically protected against developing osteoporosis, unless they have some other disease that makes their body lose calcium. So here the government was telling black women to eat things that it knew would make them sick for no benefit whatsoever. Now, even the theoretical benefit, people are told you should eat dairy because of the calcium and protect your bones is a lie. Uh, and the government knows that's a lie too, um, because Dairy calcium has never been shown to build a strong skeleton. In fact, the more you eat, the more likely you are to have osteoporosis and hip fractures. But this was just out of control. So I went to PCRM, Physicians Committee of, uh, for Responsible Medicine, spoke with the director, Dr. Neil Barnard, about this. And we decided to do a paper on uh, racial bias in the US Dietary Guidelines. And it actually ended up being a two-part paper that was published in 1999. Well when the paper was published, that's when um, uh, at, the, it was, at the time it was called Vegetarian Summerfest, it's now Vegan Summerfest, reached out to PCRM and said, we want you to come and do a um, plenary presentation on um, these, you, you know, your findings and, and these two papers. Um, and Neil asked me if I would be willing to do that. And I was, of course, thrilled to do it. And that was my first experience at Summerfest. And it was, it's still a little difficult for me to talk about this without being emotional because when you walk into Summerfest for the first time and you're on this campus where everybody, you know, all the attendees are plant-based and all of the food in the cafeteria is plant-based and all of the lectures are on some aspect of, of being plant-based 
it's like you walk into heaven on earth in a way, you know, this, this magical place where everybody gets it. Everybody understands you. Nobody makes fun of your beliefs. You don't have to stop and say, what's in this? Can I eat it? It, it was just, it, it was, it was really a watershed moment in my life. And um, as you know, uh, even though they call themselves vegetarian summer fest, they were a completely vegan event. And that's where I began to learn both about the uh, um, health issues associated with continuing to uh, eat uh, dairy and eggs, um, but also the cruelty involved in their production. Um, and um, I then determined to, to uh, remove those things from my diet. And, and I will say parenthetically that even though I was quote unquote, quote, lacto-ovo, I didn't drink milk or eat yogurt because of the fact that I would be sick as a dog. Uh, so the, the ways in which I continue to uh, uh, get those foods in my diet were primarily through things that they had been prepared in and, uh, and, and then still using cheese. Um, so it wasn't, even though I wasn't technically vegan, I was pretty close. So it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't that much of a, a, a issue to remove those things from my diet. So um, started uh, being plant-based uh, actually, as I said, 40 years ago and then for the last 20 years or so, it's been, um, or 20 years, it's been uh, completely vegan. Well, that's uh, still pretty darn good if you ask me. Yeah, so, and then um, from, so from, and, once I, as I said, even though I was it still included some dairy and some eggs, it was a, such a small amount that I was pretty close to being to being uh, completely plant based from the get go, and and I emphasize that because within three days of changing my diet, I felt the difference. I felt my health. I, I felt different. My, I, I had more energy. I needed less sleep. I just felt better. My thinking was, was, was clear. And, and it was clear to me like, wow, this was really true. You know, this is really how humans are supposed to be eating. And, and from that point forward, um, I had this burden to number one, share that information with people. But then, you know, as I started to see family members and friends uh, um, you know, whose parents and, 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 and uh, older family members were, you know, being diagnosed with cancers or dying from heart disease, um, I realized that that's, that I wanted to spend my life helping people to understand that we are designed to be plant-based creatures um, and that if we adhere to that diet, we can markedly reduce or eliminate our risk of developing heart disease, diabetes, high blood pressure, stroke, cancer and so forth, that we didn't have to live our lives slowly falling apart, becoming sick and debilitated, um, that we could have much fuller, much healthier lives. And that's why I decided to go to medical school, um, both so that I could get the background and uh, um, training in human health and disease, but also so that I would have the credentials to tell people, you need to stop this. And they would be more inclined to listen because I'm a doctor, even though we all know doctors aren't taught a lot about nutrition. Well, you went to a, a, a little medical school. I think it was called Stanford. <laughs> yes, that's right. Uh, uh, you have uh, the greatest we're... laugh. If you, if you don't make it in medicine, you can do commercials, <laughs> voiceovers. You have the most adorable laugh. Oh, thank I, you. I just have to thank read you. this from Zena. This is one okay. of my fave plant-based doctors. Love, love, love Dr. Mills. Since oh, the first absolutely. time I saw him in 2003, he's made such a major impact on my plant-based vegan journey for all these years. People, we don't get enough of you. People do love you. People are here, but they remember seeing you at Remedy. But you, we need to get you more out there because you are so beloved. But you actually have a job, right? Yes, I work as a critical care doctor in Washington, D.C., and um, uh, I do critical care related work in uh, Northern Virginia. Um, and I also work part time in some uh, uh, primary care clinics in, in Washington, D.C. as well, although with the COVID crisis, those clinics now are kind of on hold, but I'm still doing the in-hospital work uh, in, in uh, Virginia. Very nice. and, and I also, and I do that 
I mean, for practical reasons, one, I have to support myself, but also because I think it is really important to stay clinically active so that you see what's happening to people, you understand um, uh, you know, how these diseases impact people, and you're in a position to hopefully help uh, uh, encourage people to change their diet, to try and you know, either treat uh, or prevent these diseases altogether. Right. Well, people are saying that you need your own PBS special. I can. Oh, how sweet. <laughs> That's very kind. Absolutely. I've been posting every now and then your website. I didn't even know until today you had one. So I've been posting it several times in the live chat. So oh, thank you. you. Click on it and find out more about it. And you can always follow Dr. Mills on Facebook. It is his name, Milton Mills, with the word Renee, R-E-N-E, -E, in between. I know that everything pretty much has been canceled, but do you do you think you'll have any opportunities where people can see you in the future when things go back to whatever normal is going I, to be? I, I certainly hope so, because um, prior to uh, the things being shut down, I had already had um, 11 events scheduled between January and, and May. Just And that was just you know, that time period with, uh, and then I had also been asked, of course, Summerfest was coming up in uh, uh, July. And then um, I had been told about three other events that would, uh, that were coming up in, in Greenville, um, Asheville, and other places. Um, and one that was in Atlanta that, um, so there would have been plenty of, of, of opportunities uh, for people to see me. And actually that's been one of the great disappointing things about what we're going through is the fact that so many of uh, these plant-based conferences and events have been canceled. But um, I'm really hopeful that, you know, once we come through this and we get out of it, that things will start to get rescheduled and uh, we'll be able to kind of get back to our normal. Right. Well, that's why I'm doing this on, online show so that we can expose as many people sure. to wonderful doctors. Happy Healthy Life says, yes, we love Dr. Mills. Also, his occasional rants. I'm not on Facebook, so I don't know what people are talking about. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I've only seen this side of you, so I, I love what I see. And uh... Yeah, yeah there, there are rants, though. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, somebody named Jennifer said she sent in a question. So my husband is looking for it in advance okay. about her mother's cancer. Uh, but in the meantime, you know, I love that talk. I love the title of your talk. I think it's called The Biology of Disgust. Right, yes. And How did you come up with such a clever title? Well, actually, because I was reading that what prompted me to develop that talk was I was reading a paper in the psychology literature that was um, on the human emotion of disgust. And, um, and it pointed out that disgust is one of the six basic emotions that we're all born with. So this is, this is something that God, nature, whoever you choose to attribute it to has determined is important for our survival, both as individuals but also as a species. And so I'm thinking, hmm, what, what is it about disgust that's so important for keeping us alive? Well, disgust, it turns out, has three domains. There's what's called pathogen disgust, which concerns itself with things that we might ingest that could kill us. There is moral disgust, which governs things like antisocial behaviors that would disrupt our social group and decrease our chances for survival. And then there's sexual disgust. Um, well, obviously focusing on pathogen disgust, the question was what are the things that um, uh, human, the human beings are born disliking? And as I read through that list, it's, I. I don't even want to say a light bulb went on, the light bulb exploded. Um, the things that all human beings seem to have a natural aversion to are things that are moist, wet, slimy, bloody, things that are rotting, things that are covered with animal hair, animal effluent, things that are amorphous in shape. And I'm telling you, it was instantaneously clear to me, you're describing raw animal tissue. And that then explains why human beings have to change the way animal tissue looks, feels, smells, and tastes in order to make it uh, acceptable to us. Then I thought about, well, let's think about edible plant parts. 
Well, edible plant parts are typically hand-sized, smooth edged, rounded, firm objects that of course taste like plants. So what do we do to animal tissue to make it acceptable to us? We skin these creatures, we chop their bodies up into these smooth edge, rounded objects that are typically small enough to fit in our hand. We drain the blood out of it. We cook it to make it not slimy and mushy, but firm. But most importantly, we cover it with plants to make it taste like the plants that our brain really wants. And I'm like, oh my God, this is why we have to do what we do to animal tissue to make it acceptable so that we can dis circumvent that natural disgust response to it. And uh, um, that's where that, that talk uh, originated. That's how it came to be. Yeah, it's, it's a really, really good one. And you have another one about the Bible where you talk about the Bible in, in eating meat because so many people sure, use sure. the Bible as the reason to eat meat. Uh, which is, I, 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 yeah, I, I, my brain starts to run into itself because that is such complete nonsense that it is very clear uh, from reading the Bible that God intended for us to be plant-based, that... Um, uh, there's a, the whole um, first chapter of Daniel that shows that when you are plant-based, it will make you healthier, more agile in mind um, than people who are eating meat. Um, and um, the Bible also makes it clear that once uh, people actually, uh, the, the earth is cleansed and, and remade, that we're going to go back to being uh, plant-based. That's a famous passage uh, from Isaiah chapter 11, where it says the wolf shall lie down with the lamb and, and, the, uh, uh, and the, uh, each, uh, the, the lion and the bear shall eat straw like the ox. Because once again, all animals, everything will be vegan because that is God's original plan. That is what he's going to take us back to. And it's clearly what's best for us. Um, le and let me say um, to, uh, to the listeners, that um, they can find the talk that you referred to, uh, uh, Meat Eating and the Biology of Disgust, under its original title. But I was asked to do that talk in, um, for the uh, Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, uh, I guess about three years ago. And they asked me to modify the title because they thought that might've been too clinical for some people. So the, the, the updated version of that lecture is called Meat Eating and Mind Games. Okay, uh, but it's pretty much the same lecture. It's just the meat eating and mind games is, excuse me, a more updated version of the lecture. And would this possibly be on YouTube? Oh yeah, they're both on YouTube, absolutely. Okay, uh, you know, while you're talking, I'll look for them, but I want to read a few of the nice comments because you have a lot of fans. Zena says, I have always wanted him to put out a book based on his fantastic comparative anatomy lectures. I've even asked him about it several times. In the past. <laughs> I know he's a super busy man, but this would be such a necessary book. I agree with, I couldn't agree with her more. And I am trying my best to, to uh, find a way to take enough time off that I can do that because I agree it is absolutely needed because it is so important in my opinion that people understand that we are not meant to eat meat. Because if you understand that, that in my view is a complete game changer because it then means that what we're doing to other animals, what we're doing to the earth, what we're doing to ourselves is a crime in, in, in every way, that it's completely unnecessary. Um, and that um, uh, you know we shouldn't be killing these animals in the first place, and then we wouldn't be destroying the earth. And of course, we wouldn't be destroying our health. Yeah. Well, Jan says, what about animals eating other animals? And Monica says, my mother always brings up that Jesus ate fish. Do you have a great comeback for that argument? Um, the, well, there's actually only one instance. First of all, <laughs> um, the question about animals eating animals is, um, you know, what does that have to do with us? Um, so, you know, uh, so for instance, people will, will come and say, well, lions eat meat. Okay, lions are carnivores, but you're not a carnivore. If I put you into a pen with a, um, you know, 1200 pound uh, steer and no weapons, you wouldn't be able to do anything but run from it. Um, secondly, lions have completely different physiology and anatomy than we do, which is why they 
uh, uh, eat these animals. Two, they can eat fat and cholesterol and not get heart attacks. We can't. And three, um, lions also kill their mothers, like male lions, when they take over pride, they kill all of their mother's children so that they will uh, go back into estrus and they can have their own kids. Should we emulate that behavior as well? Of course not. So, you know, it is ridiculous for people to look at what animals do and try to say that we should behave that way. We are not those animals. We're not those species. That is not how we are meant to live. Now, why the, the, the question of why is that necessary at all is actually a religious question. And what I mean by that is that when God confronted Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden after they had sinned, one of the first things he said to them, he said, cursed is the earth for your sake. Thorns and thistles shall it bear, and henceforth in the sweat of your face shall you eat uh, your, your, your daily bread. What, what was he saying? Well, once human beings sinned, then instead of being able to have access to the fruit from the tree of life and live forever and the animals uh, eating that fruit and continuing to live uh, indefinitely, decay and disease had then been int introduced into the world. So God had to change his creation, which is referred to as cursing it, so that now you had to have ways of weeding out that disease and that death to try and keep um, um, the uh, ecology as healthy as it could be until he resolved this whole question of sin and unrighteousness. And that's where the, some of the animals that formerly had been completely plant-based became meat eaters. So the reason these animals are meat eaters is so they can do exactly what they do in nature. And that is weed out the sick, the old, the disease, and try and keep the environment healthy. But that again is something that is temporary because once again, as we're told in Isaiah, when God gets rid of sin, all of the animals are going to be uh, plant-based once again. But the, uh, the, the question is, so when he cursed the earth, did that uh, mean that we were supposed to eat meat? No, because when, in that same conversation, in Genesis 3.18, he enlarged Adam and Eve's diet and told them, um, you shall eat the plants of the field, with, which if you go back to Genesis, had been reserved for the animals. But because he was now going to bar their access to the fruit from the tree of life, which we can infer had the ability to perpetuate life indefinitely, because in a conversation God is having uh, the, the father and son, he says, um, we have to bar their access to the tree of life, lest they put forth their hand and live forever and become eternally living sinners. So that means that the fruit of the tree of life had within it qualities that would help restore, rebuild, and uh, um, uh, uh, our, our tissues. Well, since he's taking that away, he partially replaced it with uh, the plants of the field, which are your uh, vegetables, legumes, grains, and so forth, which as we know, have a lot of the nutrients that we need to, to live a healthy life. Um, but but my, my fundamental point is that both before and after sin entered into the world, God instructed us to be strictly plant-based. We were not turned into meat eaters. It was only other animals. And he refers to that as a curse. And something that people often miss um, when they read the gospels is that one of the reasons Jesus wore the crown of thorns on his head on the cross was that he was not only redeeming uh, humanity, he was redeeming the earth. Now, what about the, 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 we're told that Jesus quote unquote ate fish. The one time that we are told that Jesus himself ate fish was actually after his resurrection when he met with the disciples and Thomas did not believe that he was real. And so he said, here, give me a piece of fish um, uh, and I'll eat it to show you that I am real. That was a religious uh, uh, ceremony. It was not a nutritional uh, 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 object lesson. So he wasn't showing us what we're supposed to eat. He did that to show that he was an actual living, breathing human being. Um, and people need to be clear about that. That's great. I just want to uh, read you a really nice comment from Sharon. And by the way, you know, everything you said about how we can't even tolerate eating meat unless we put delicious plants on them. I mean, okay. it's true. <laughs> it's so, it's so absolutely true. true. 
I mean, you could take styrofoam peanuts and put barbecue sauce on it. <laughs> yeah, and so, that's true. Yes. Yeah. Maybe my next cookbook it's will called, be uh, ways to rice. Make They're called rice cakes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Sharon McRae says, Dr. Mills taught me one of the most profound notions about trying to influence others to eat a healthy plant-based diet at Vegetarian Summerfest one year. He talked about turning on the lights quickly in a dark movie theater and uh. how our reaction would be to cover our eyes. But if the lights are raised gradually, our eyes have time to adjust. I love this analogy and try to remember it whenever talking to someone about changing their diet. Oh, wow. That's a really beautiful comment. And she's referring to... Uh, a lecture I do called Having the Courage of Our Convictions. And, um, and again, I developed that lecture because, um, you know, I had heard a lot of people talking about the fact that they had such a hard time being around family members during the holidays and, uh, at, you know, special occasions, because even though they themselves were plant-based, their family members are you know, eating meat and Thanksgiving, there's a butchered animals or a couple of them sitting on the table. And, and, and that's, you know, for sensible, sensitive people, that's, that's a really difficult thing uh, to have to um, observe. And a lot of people said that for that reason that they either had stopped going to uh, family gatherings or they were tempted to do that. And the point of the lecture was that no, we have to be there. We have to be there to, to, to give a voice to um, those that don't have a voice, whose voice has been taken away. And that, you know, God has appointed us as ambassadors of truth. And the only way we can do that job is if we are present where we need to be present. There's um, a, a famous quote. Um, I can't remember uh, the woman's full name. I think her first name is Clarice. Um, but she says, wherever you don't fit in, that is where you belong. And um, that's something that has always stayed with me. Wherever you don't fit in, that is where you belong. And, you know, and, and so what I said in this lecture was that we shouldn't be uh, dismayed or put off by the fact that our loved ones or our friends are not receptive to what we have what we're trying to teach them and show them immediately because it again it's like sitting in darkness if somebody turns on light all of a sudden that hurts and our tendency is to close our eyes and turn away from it and we have to give people time to get used to the truth time to get used to the light so that they can see the beauty that they've been missing in their lives and so um it, it's it's really wonderful to 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 know that that analogy resonated and stayed with her. And I, I, I still think it's a very apt one. Very, very nice. Jessica says, meeting him in Kansas City was absolutely life-changing and affirming. It gave me the courage and confidence in my daily walk and choices. So you have an impact on a lot of people. Wow, wow. That yeah. is, that's, that's very nice to hear. Uh, Pri says, I had the pleasure of seeing Dr. Mills speak at the VegFest in the UK. It was such an incredible talk. The world needs more physicians like him. As a medical student, he is such a huge inspiration to me. I bet you didn't know this because we never hang out. <laughs> wow. Oh. Well, anyway, um, Cersei, I hope I'm pronouncing her name right, says, do you have any social media handles and can you please talk about dairy addiction? Sure. Uh, well, again, um, on Facebook, I'm Milton Renee Mills. My avatar is a hat uh, and suit, uh, no face. And then, uh, of course, my website. Um, and wow, you know, the, the thing that I would I want to say about dairy is that what's um, becoming clear, first of all, dairy products, I, I, I've, I've made up in my mind, I'm never going to refer to them as dairy foods because they're not foods. Nature never, ever, ever intended that adult mammals should drink any kind of milk, number one. And it certainly never intended that adult humans should be drinking the uh, milk or products made from the milk of another species. So dairy products are the most unnatural thing that, that human beings consume. And when I think it's important that people stop to think about what milk is. Milk is a uh, biological secre secretion designed by nature 
for specific species. And the fact of the matter is that, let's say one of your listeners out there is pregnant and she also has a cat or a dog that's pregnant. And they both deliver at roughly the same time, but unfortunately their pet uh, mother that gave birth passes away. Well, if that woman thought to herself, you know what, I'm gonna be heroic and I'm gonna pump enough milk for both my baby and the kittens or puppies. If she tried to raise uh, puppies or kittens on human milk, they would die because human milk does not have nearly enough energy or enough protein in it to sustain these carnivore babies. Um, and the uh, um, one of the reasons cow's milk will make a baby grow is because it actually has much more um, uh, fat and protein than human babies need. Um, but it comes at a cost. It causes health problems uh, in, in, in our children. And it also tends to cause them to grow too fast um, in ways they shouldn't be growing, which puts them at risk for developing cancers like colon cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer later on in life. Um, so dairy really is something that people need to avoid because it is so unhealthy particularly the way that these animals are raised in uh, uh, the American uh, um, dairy industry. Uh, the cows are given all sorts of synthetic hormones to make them not only grow faster, but produce more milk. And those hormones um, come through in the milk. And, you, you know, I, um, I, I t one of the most ludicrous things you always run into is people will say, oh, I don't eat soy because it has uh, phytoestrogens in it. And I asked them, well, how do you get a cow to give you milk? Do you just walk up to her and say, hey, Bessie, give me some milk? Well, no, of course, she has to be pregnant and she has to have delivered. And what that means is that if she's pregnant, her body is filled with estrogen and that estrogen comes out in the milk. And so why would you balk at eating plant estrogens, which really don't function like normal estrogen, they were actually protective and reduce our uh, disease risk, but you're, you're ingesting all of this real estrogen. And um, you probably are aware that there's a recent study that was done on over 53,000 women that showed that uh, drinking as little as a half a cup of milk uh, two or three times a week increased breast cancer risk by 30%. If you went up to a cup of milk a day, it increased breast, breast cancer risk by over 50%. And if you had one or more cups a day, it increased breast cancer risk by 80%, 70 to 80%. And that's, again, because of all of these growth stimulants and hormones in this. And for the guys out there, just substitute prostate cancer for the breast cancer. The leading uh, um, risk factor for developing prostate cancer and aggressive deadly prostate cancer in the American diet is the consumption of dairy products. So dairy is just is just massively unhealthy. But I, I want to share something with you and I want to be clear that what I'm about to share with you is a hypothesis that I have developed. Um, I don't have scientific proof of this but based on my understanding of how our immune system and our GI system works, I think that this hypothesis is valid. And what is that? That I believe that the lactose and uh, uh, dairy proteins in milk actually uh, lower our immune system function. So somebody might be saying, wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. why should that be? Why should uh, consuming dairy foods um, uh, or dairy products, excuse me, lower um, the uh, um, activity of our immune system. Well, number one, the vast majority of our immune tissue actually is distributed throughout our GI tract. And it's meant to protect us from ingesting pathogens and, and, and other compounds that could make us sick from the food we eat, that we eat. Because clearly, what, number one, we eat more food um, than uh, anything else over the course of our lives. Number two, the total surface area of our gastrointestinal tract is about 400 square meters, which is the size of a singles tennis court. So it's a huge area. And you have to be able to protect that area from uh, um, uh, um, 
pathogens and, and bugs and bacteria, fungi, viruses. But again, why would nature want to lower immune activity if an animal's ingesting dairy foods? Well, when a baby is drinking its mother's milk, what's in that milk that the baby is supposed to ingest? It's her antibodies. And these are technically foreign proteins to that child's system. So in order to adequately uh, ingest that, you need the immune system to stand down a little bit and allow that baby to absorb these proteins, these antibodies from its mother. So even though it, you're decreasing the immune system, it won't have a negative effect because the baby is getting passive immunity from its mom. Uh, so, that is, uh, 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 so that's another way in which I think dairy foods can harm our health by decreasing our immune surveillance and making it more likely that uh, since we are adults and shouldn't be ingesting in the first place, instead of absorbing uh, um, antibodies from our mother, we're going to in fact be absorbing these uh, zoonotic viruses, uh, bacteria, and other things that will ultimately go on to make us ill. That's great. Trey says that he wonders if uh, childhood asthma is because of dairy consumption. Do you have any thoughts on that? There is no question that childhood asthma is made worse by dairy consumption. And so um, I think that yes, to an extent, it can be triggered by the uh, ingestion of dairy products, because again, um, dairy products cause the respiratory tree to manufacture a lot more mucus, uh, which will, and dairy products are also very pro-inflammatory. Uh, pro and the hallmarks of asthma are inflammation of the bronchial tree and excess mucus production, which plugs up those uh, uh, respiratory airways and causes the uh, child or even adult to go into an asthma attack. So there is no question that, that they probably precipitate it, but they absolutely make it worse. Great. So a few people actually wrote questions in, in advance, and this is from Dana. And she said, somebody who's had breast cancer in the past is now on a plant-based SOS-free diet regarding soy. Is edamame a better soy, source of soy than tofu because the tofu is processed? And if so, how much edamame should one eat in a week? And how many broccoli sprouts should one eat in a week? And can you please explain the benefits of soy and broccoli sprouts for someone who's had cancer? Sure. Um, people, again, get very confused about phytoestrogens. Plant estrogens are estrogen-like compounds. They are not functional estrogen. And so what will happen is the phytoestrogens will actually come along and um, attach themselves to the estrogen receptors, but they don't activate those receptors. They essentially block them. So plant estrogens actually lower total estrogenic activity in a woman's body. The other thing that they do is as the blood that is uh, um, uh, with the nutrients absorbed from our meal passes through the liver and the liver sees the phytoestrogens, the liver says, oh, I gotta make more of this protein called sex hormone binding protein. And again, the higher the level of sex hormone uh, binding protein in the body, it will uh, grab onto uh, free circulating estrogen or free circulating testosterone, and again, lower the overall uh, estrogenic or testosterone activity in the body, which will reduce a woman's risk for all hormone-related cancers, not just breast cancer, but endometrial ovarian cancer as well. In men, it reduces our risk for prostate cancer and something called BPH or benign prostatic hypertrophy, where you're prostate swells up to the size of a basketball and makes it impossible for you to pee. So these things are incredibly protective. Now, broccoli being a cruciferous vegetable actually has very potent anti-cancer uh, uh, compounds in it and actually all, uh, works to not only uh, suppress uh, cancer cells, but to also directly kill them. And that's one of the reason, reasons that broccoli, broccoli sprouts, and other cruciferous cruciferous vegetables are really healthy and it's super important to include them in your diet on a regular basis. Plus they, there is a uh, receptor in the uh, uh, intestine that 
these compounds from the broccoli uh, attaches to, Michael Greger talks about this, that activate our immune cells and makes our immune system much more uh, uh, robust and active. So for all those reasons, it's important to, to make sure that we're eating uh, uh, a, a wide variety of cruciferous vegetables all the time. Now, with respect to how much um, soy a person should eat, I mean, I, I can't say, I can't put a, a, a number on it. I mean, what I will say is that I don't think anybody should be eating only soy um, I, uh, because again, the greater the, the variety in our diet, the healthier it is. Um, I, I would also say to her that I don't think that she needs to worry about tofu being processed because it's a natural process uh, of fermentation that creates the tofu. And I think tofu is, is healthy. Um, it, it, it has somewhat less fiber than it did initially. So you wanna make sure you're eating it with a lot of uh, vegetables, but uh, 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 tofu, tempeh, which is made from the whole bean is even better because it still has the fiber in it, but people should not be afraid of tofu. Terrific. Wow, this is, I don't know, this question is really, really long. So I'm gonna have to be <laughs> through it before. So I'm gonna ask a shorter one first. Okay. And this is from Susan. And she asks, is there any data that describes how eating plants might lessen the probability of being susceptible to COVID-19? And is there any chance that eating only plants for the last six years might override a 213 heart attack as a comorbidity factor for catching the virus? Okay. So, um, wow, that, that's a, that is a complex and interesting question. And we'll have to arrive at the answers through inferences. Um, so there is no question that there is abundant data that shows that plant-based diets boost our immune function. In fact, um, uh, um, Dr. Uh, Colin Campbell actually put out a, a video about uh, plant foods and immunity. Um, Dr. Um, uh, uh, Joel Furman, has um, a book out called Super Immunity, where he talks about the impact of various foods on our immune system. And, you know, again, I tell patients, I tell people I talk to that if you want to maximize your resistance to uh, COVID-19, you absolutely need to eliminate the animal products. I already just talked about the fact that dairy products uh, decrease immune function. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's you know, a major reason to eliminate them. I also think that not only um, can and does uh, dead animal tissue serve as a reservoir and vector for COVID-19, I also believe that ingesting animal protein also decreases um, immune activity. So we need to eliminate those things from our diet if we're still uh, uh, eating them. Um, and then there are compounds within plant foods that actually boost immune function um, and that are really important for optimal immune function. And there's, again, a super variety of those things. And, and so I would encourage people to, to look for Colin Campbell's video on plant foods and immunity and uh, also Dr. Furman's book on super immunity, where he talks about how plant foods can help um, uh, uh, improve our immune function and even turbocharge it. So that is uh, um, the, the answer that I would give to that. Uh, now, having said that, that doesn't mean that you're Superman and bulletproof. So even when you're eating a plant-based diet and have you know this turbocharged immune system, you still should make sure that when you're out in public, you're wearing your personal protective equipment. So you have on a mask, um, and, uh, and, and so forth, uh, because we need to do everything we can to protect ourselves and our family against this, this, this uh, pathogen. That's great. So you can see this is really long, so I'm gonna uh -huh. summarize, but Jennifer says she spoke with you after her mother's cancer and question regarding disease reversal when you debuted a lecture a few months ago at the Rochester Lifestyle Medicine Institute. It sounds like the cancer's gotten worse. It's now a deemed, it reached her brain and deemed inoperable, but it looks like her question is, what are your suggestions for me to be able to make a compelling enough case to her and her husband while she still retains a modicum of her faculties? Sure. You know, what Sharon McRae said, you're talking about turning that light on slowly. So maybe when it's a 
serious situation. Maybe we have to just turn no, it No, you, you absolutely. Let, let me say this. Um, I still have not convinced my own mother to become plant-based. I mean, she's made some movement, but not, you know, not fully. And she's has a lot of issues with arthritis pain and so forth. Um, I think what this uh, young lady is referring to is the lecture I did in Rochester on diet and cancer, which is also on YouTube, which I would uh, strongly, strongly encourage uh, um, uh, people to watch. And let me, by way of addressing that question, talk about the provenance of that lecture. Over and over, uh, as I lectured around the country and even in Europe, I kept meeting people who came up to me to tell me that, and this was specifically um, when I was doing the talk, are, are humans designed to eat meat? Showing that we are not designed at all to be meat eaters, either as carnivores or even omnivores, that we are designed to strict plant eaters. And people would come up to me and tell me about how they had advanced stage cancer that they completely cured on a plant-based diet. Um, and the stories were remarkably similar in, 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 in some respects. And what that was, was that the people, when they were diagnosed with these, and I'm talking stage two, stage three colon cancer, there was a woman who had stage three breast cancer, which according to medical uh, um, theory is a death sentence. Um, women with stage three breast cancer typically do not live more than five years. Um, and then there was a gentleman who had stage four liver cancer and was told by the Lombardi Cancer Center at Georgetown here in DC that he had six months or less to live. They all converted and, and they all converted to a strictly plant-based diet. But interestingly, they all also said that they became um, a raw vegan for at least six to eight months before they started phasing uh, back uh, in cooked foods. And again, those are still only plant foods. And so it was very clear to me that um, a plant-based diet has tremendous power to, uh, um, uh, to, to heal the body and help reverse these, these cancers. But the problem is that when people are undergoing conventional treatment for cancer, they are told that they should continue eating what they have been eating. And the thing that I, again, focused on and emphasized in this lecture was how animal protein drives cancer and, and makes cancer cells grow. And that's why it's so important to eliminate these things. So the bottom line is that I'm not sure what her mom is doing, but um, I don't think that she has eliminated all of the animal foods from her diet. And the, the thing that I would try to do is to get the, any family member affected by cancer to watch that lecture and see the importance of eliminating all animal foods immediately, but also to consider going on a healthy plant-based raw diet for a period of time, because that's what's shown the most efficacy from these individual stories uh, in helping to arrest even late stage cancers. Now, I, again, I can't guarantee it's gonna work for everybody, but in terms of the best chance people have, that is what they should do. Thank you. You know, when I think about it, when I was diagnosed with precancerous polyps in 2003, I was 100% raw for two years and I, and I reversed it within six months. Um, I do eat obviously cooked food now, but I, I recently <laughs> just heard you on the Raw Food Mastery Summit and that's what had me reach out to you actually, because I really enjoyed your interview. And I've been posting your YouTube lectures and I just posted the one to the link diet and cancer so people can sure. just click on Thank that you. and find it. Of course, you know, the first but, time- But AJ, was, let me just stop you again. It's consistent. You said in six months, it was, it was reversed. I'm telling you, these, when you hear consistent stories like this, that's telling you that it's necessary to do this and it's necessary to do it for a minimum of six months. But go ahead. I, I'm sorry. I just wanted to point out that this is the same story. And thank you. So the first time I ever saw you was at the Healthy Lifestyle Expo in, in Southern California. Oh, Bedford. right. Jeff Nelson's, yes. And, and, my, and you were on a panel with other plant-based <laughs> doctors. 
that we're arguing. I don't need to call attention to it, but you maintain composure. (laughs) Um, Yeah, and you know, how can I say this? Um, Growing up as an African-American man really helped me in a lot of ways because from a very early age, people were telling me, oh, you're not that smart or you aren't as capable or you don't know what you're talking about. And very early in my life, I had to learn to reject that nonsense and to have faith in what I knew to be true. And so when I'm confronted with situations like that, where you've got people who are like, oh no, you don't know, it doesn't faze me. I'm like, look, I grew up in the ghetto. You got to come better than that. <laughs> that's kind of my attitude. So yeah. Yeah, it, it, that, but that's, and I said, this guy's got a good head on his shoulder. He's not getting in the either side. He's just giving his own answer and staying out of it. Right, exactly. And just yeah, yeah. that's what point, I try to be. I try to be to the truth. I yeah. try to be Switzerland, you know. I just yeah. don't want to be fighting with other people that are doing good and you know. Yeah. So uh, Denise says, What is your take on oil? Some plant-based doctors are saying it's healthy and can even lower LDL. Sure. Um, I think okay, so let me just say um that the data um show that when the amount of oil in our diet goes above 20 to 25%, that's when we start to see an increase in disease risk. So I would say for everyone, you want, if you use oil in your diet, um, you want to try and keep it uh, in a range of 15 to 20%, okay? And, and, or say 10 to 20%, let me just make it broader. However, if you are currently being challenged by a disease like cancer, Um, heart disease, uh, maybe even diabetes, I would try to get to get as close to no added oil as possible. Um, um, But for someone who is otherwise healthy and is not currently battling some chronic disease, I think you can have a limited amount of oil in your diet and be healthy, but we still need to eat a lot less oil than average Americans eat and uh, what is common in our-, our um, Right, and, but if you're struggling with weight, I would say maybe eliminate it because it no, is- No, no, again, yeah, that's true too. Yes, absolutely. It's pretty calorically dense. Carol says, what an amazing man with an amazing and positive outlook. I only bring you guys good people. What can I tell you? <laughs> exactly. Well, it's just got, I just love talking to you. I mean, you know, maybe we could do this every week. We can call it Monday with Milton. <laughs> How sweet. <laughs> because people need to get some more more of you. We don't see enough of you, you know? And now now I'm going to put these, I'm going to post every single YouTube lecture I can find in the show notes so that people wow. can go back and watch it. Okay. So here's, right. a, here's just a, let's add that this, this is a fun question from Monica. Do you find plant-based foods at the hospital you work at or do you pack your lunch every day? I, if, if, if someone could take a picture of me going into the hospital, I'm always going in with a, big bag of food because no, I can't trust the hospital to have something I'm going to eat. And, and over the years, I found that that was always the safest way to guarantee that I had something that was healthy, nutritious, and completely plant-based because even, you know, a lot of times you don't know, are they putting chicken broth in the vegetables or the rice or, you know, or, or, or whatever. And, and the things that, that um, um, might look like they're okay, you know, you can't be sure a lot of times of what's in them. So I just find the easiest thing to do uh, is to take my food with me. That's great. Were you ever able to influence any of your colleagues? Oh, absolutely. I've had um, two or three of my colleagues who have become plant-based um, over the years. Yeah. That's great. So what, what's next? How, what, what are your closing thoughts? So my closing thoughts are um, that, again, there is no question that um, a plant-based lifestyle is what's best for human beings, best for our planets, and certainly doesn't require the infliction of cruelty and suffering on on other animals. And that, again, as the um, uh, earlier caller, caller pointed out, that we can't be either surprised or dismayed when people who don't know what we know 
don't embrace what we want to, to share with them immediately. Because again, this is something that's foreign. It's like light hurting your eyes, but that we still have to stand in there. And uh, I think the, the, the phrase that I used in the lecture was remain quietly persistent. So you don't want to, you know, hassle people or harangue them or beat them over the head, but you want to stay there as a witness. And it will get through to people because when they see other people having problems that you're not having, when they see that you're uh, healthier, that you are uh, more resistant to a lot of the other problems that people have, then they're eventually going to come by, come back and say, hey, what is it about what you're doing that, that uh, um, uh, is, is helping you to, to, to be so healthy and have such a healthy lifestyle? And um, I always remind people that none of us ask for fried chicken, ice cream, or pork chop in the delivery room. Because as babies, we're born without preferences. And everything we think we like or can't live without, somebody taught us to like that. Meaning it's a learned habit. And if it's learned, it can be unlearned. And we can unlearn those bad habits and learn healthier ones. And once we change our life, we'll be as happy or actually happier than, than we ever were. Because I look back and the thought that I used to put dead, rotting corpses in my body horrifies me. I only did it for 16 years, but still, um, it, it, it's, it's, it, it, and it fills me with revulsion and disgust. I have absolutely no desire to ever return to that. And um, uh, uh, I'm much happier, much healthier as a result. Right. Well, people are saying you're a compassionate, honorable, compassionate, honorable man. Your life is a testament, testimonial to other people. And I just want to end with this uh, comment from Sharon McRae because I can't, I couldn't have said it better. Oh, Sharon, she's one of my good Facebook friends. Yeah. She's <laughs> She says, keep shining your light, Dr. Mills. We are so grateful for you. And I couldn't agree more. Oh, how sweet. That is wonderful. And let me just say to all of the people who tuned in, um, I, I can't tell you guys how much it means to me to hear the things that you've shared. Um, because, you know, the, the, I think the, the, one of the main things we want to be sure and do with our lives is to have a positive impact on people. And so to hear this from, from the uh, people who participated today really um, just encourages me. It moves me. It, it um, lets me know that what I'm doing is, is helping people. And that's all I can ask for in life. Right. Well, you keep doing it, but my preference would be for you to do it in California. <laughs> well, mine too. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm looking for a way to do it. If I could find a job that paid me enough money, believe me, I'd be there in a heartbeat. Okay. <laughs> Have you ever thought of doing stand-up comedy? Um, you know, I, I've, I've considered that a little bit because I'm a bit of a jokester, but um, I, I, I'd have to really steal myself for that one. <laughs> okay, because I'm in a class right now and I'm going to be performing and I'm going to send you a link and maybe you'll join Okay, you okay, time. cool. All cool. right. No, that, that, that could be fun, yes. All right. Thanks so much, everyone, for watching. Please come back at 2 p.m. when I'll be interviewing Brad Stolberg, a performance coach. He's going to be talking about burnout. It's going to be another great interview. And again, thank you, Dr. Mills. I loved catching up. And AJ, thank you for all that you're doing. I mean, this is you, you, you are helping to change the world for the better. Thank great. you. Thank you. Love you. Bye. All right. we'll, we'll talk soon. All right. Bye-bye.